Hello and welcome class to part three of chapter 12, wherein we discuss what are known as the unit cells of crystalline solids, the little nuggets <laughs> that we can use as a comprehensive picture for the whole. All right, so we are going to be focusing on crystalline lattices. This we talked about last lecture, the difference between amorphous solids and crystalline solids. We will still be discussing crystalline solids due to the fact that these form very nice, long-ranged, consistent crystals. Now a crystal lattice, by technical definition, this is just a 3D array of particles. These could be, again, atoms, molecules, ions, uh, all depending on what materials are going into your structure, but what they all have in common is that they are forming very rigid structures with definite shapes and volumes. All right, so the shapes and volumes we can trace back ultimately to the chemical composition. The shape specifically is going to be dependent on what materials are going into your structure and the volume will be dependent on how much of that material you have. So here we have uh, on the slide an illustration of a really beautiful crystal, uh, the chemical formula of which looks fairly complicated, a little bit further beyond the scope of this class. But suffice to say that we have uh, a bunch of cobalt, we have a bunch of benzene present here, we have uh, some oxalate, which we have now worked with in lab, and uh, we also have this tetrafluoroboron, uh, or borate, uh, like negative polyatomic ion present as well. So there's a lot going on. Due to the complicated size, the complicated shape of this uh, individual molecule, we can see that the crystalline uh, solid that forms is going to have a pretty complicated picture as well. So each of these molecular formulas are coming together to try and stabilize themselves as much as they can. Due to the complicated nature of this structure, as well as how many atoms are actually present inside of the total comprehensive structure, it can be sometimes nice just to pick out a small section, which we can see boxed here, that is going to represent for us a small picture, a snapshot of what the big picture is. This we call a unit cell. This is the basic unit of a crystalline solid that when tiled, repeat or creates a repeating pattern that looks just like the large comprehensive solid. In other words, the unit cell is able to form a tessellation. Tessellations are also repeating patterns created by tiling the same shape. Now, sometimes in tessellations, like what is being illustrated here by M.C. Escher, uh, is that the individual tile can be like rotated, it can be mirrored, it can be flipped, uh, but each of these individual tiles, each of these individual lizards here is the exact same shape and can be fit together to form one really awesome looking tiled picture. Unit cells are a little bit different, at least at the level that we are talking about them. We will simply be translating them. So we're not going to be rotating them, we're not going to be inverting them, we are simply going to be sliding them along the uh, x-axis, along the y-axis, and creating a tiled pattern that way. So our tessellations are even more simple than those depicted by artists like M.C. Escher. Now because when creating a unit cell, one can sometimes end up chopping atoms in half, for instance, if we go back to our structure here, we can see that our line cuts like this blue atom in half. It cuts these purple atoms in half. Uh, it looks almost as though it's cutting this yellow atom in the corner into quarters. We're going to have to consider the fact that yes, these unit cells do not physically right, cut these atoms literally in half, but rather we are depicting half of an atom being within the unit cell for the purpose of being able to tessellate it, right? We're translating it horizontally and vertically, and so as a result, we're gonna end up chopping some of our atoms up along the edges. So what are the possible fractions that atoms can take inside of unit cells? Inside of our ionic unit cell, or even an 
elemental unit cell, a molecular unit cell, atoms will often get cut into smaller, more repeatable pieces. And the fractions that we see the most commonly are a totally uncut, complete whole atom sometime or somewhere inside of the structure. This is going to, in very large unit cells, comprise most of the atoms, but in very small or simple unit cells, these are actually fairly uncommon. The more common pieces that we will be working with are the half atom, which is the result of just chopping this sphere in half, the quarter atom, which we can see we're chopping this half in half again, as well as the eighth atom, which is the result of cutting the sphere three different ways. Now the half atoms end up finding their way onto what are known as the faces of the unit cell. The quarter atom oftentimes ends up uh, kind of wedging itself on the edge of a unit cell. And the eighth atom oftentimes ends up on the corner of the unit cell. And we will be seeing illustrations exactly of where these atoms fit in a moment, but I do want to acknowledge the fractions of the atoms before we start seeing these smaller, uh, like let's say simpler unit cells. We will not be working with molecular or even uh, largely covalent unit cells. We are going to be focusing strictly on the elemental slash metallic as well as the ionic. These are going to be the most easy for us to work with at the like rudimentary gen chem level. So let's talk about all of the different ways that our atoms can arrange themselves inside of a unit cell in these nice repeating patterns. Now the first unit cell definition, the first type of unit cell that we are going to be discussing is literally the simplest unit cell that we can make. It is the result of what is known as cubic packing. Now this cubic packing follows what is called the AA motif. And I'm gonna change color just to illustrate what the AA motif means in this uh, like little structure right here. So the AA motif is labeled this way because all of the atoms are directly stacked on top of each other. So for example, if we, let's say, arbitrarily define this axis as being the A axis, we can see that in the layer, each or in each of these layers, the atoms are directly stacked on top of each other along the A axis. So from layer one to layer two to layer three, all of these are A's in terms of coordinate, and so we call this the AA motif. We could name this the AAAAA motif, you know, indefinitely because each of the atoms will be indefinitely stacked on top of each other, but AA is the simplest, right, literally the shortest way that we can represent this repeating pattern. Now the point of creating a unit cell is to represent this structure by taking the most simple cutout of it. So what is the smallest, smallest, arrangement that we can make that would, when tessellated or when translated, would recreate the large picture. Well, it turns out that the smallest that we can get is by picking out an atom on each of the corners of this cube, hence why it's called a cubic packing pattern, because when repeated, we're gonna make a very large cube. In the central picture here, we have a space filling illustration of what the atoms are, where they would be located, and when to uh, like scaled approximately to size, we can see that the atoms are like directly touching when making this structure. The simplified version on the right follows more of the ball and stick illustration uh, kind of method, which we again first introduced in the fall semester. So uh, we're more focused on the bonds in the illustration on the right, we're more focused on the atoms themselves in the illustration on the left, but both of these things say the exact same thing. Neither one of these though is truly the unit cell because it's not actually the smallest representation that we can get. The entire point of making the unit cell is that this is going to be the smallest repeating uh, unit that we can find. And so the way that we actually can find the smallest unit cell is by taking our space filling cube and shaving off some of the edges. This is going to give us a truer representation of a cube. So we're literally going to shave off the top half here. We're gonna shave off the bottom halves of the atoms. We're gonna shave off these halves here. And what we will end up with as a result is this really nice structured cube, which is literally 
the smallest repeatable unit that we can make from this cubic packing pattern. And if we were to take one of these more cubic-like shapes and or tessellate it directly to the left, tessellate it directly up, and uh, expand that way infinitely, we would be able to come back and recreate our original cubic packing pattern. All right, so this is the illustration of what our unit cell looks like. The unit cell is labeled as the simple cubic or SC unit cell. This is the unit cell that represents the cubic packing pattern. So the unit cell is simple cubic. The overall packing pattern on the large scale is known as the cubic packing. So we can see that cubic is present in both of these words. If you end up using these two terms interchangeably, that's totally fine. I would never mark you points off for that. We're still kind of learning what this language means. All right, so let's inspect our uh, unit cell here. I'm also gonna clean up the slide a little bit just to, uh, you know, let's say clean it, just give myself some more space to work. All right, so we're gonna focus on our unit cell down here in the lower right. First, what we're going to do is count how many atoms total are present inside of this unit cell. Notice, again, we have cut our atoms up. We no longer have whole atoms in each of these corners. So the question is, what fraction of the atom do we have in each of these individual corner spaces here? Well, if we consider how many ways these atomic pieces were cut, uh, there was a first slice up here on the top. There is a second, uh, which would, after the first slice, give us half an atom. The second slice gives us a quarter atom, and the third slice gives us an eighth of an atom. And if we go back to our previous slide to compare the shapes here, yes, it appears as though our corner piece looks like this one eighth of an atom, which I did already say tends to be the shape that exists in the corner of a unit cell. All right, so we have an eighth of an atom present in each of the corners of this simple cubic unit cell. So we have an eighth here, we have an eighth here, we have an eighth here, and the question is how many eighths do we have? Well, there are eight corners, eight corners in a cube, and we have one eighth of an atom inside of each of these corners, just kind of nestled right into the corner. If we multiply these two things together, right, eight corners times an eighth of an atom per corner, we end up with a total of one atom. Now, obviously it's not one big atom inside of the unit cell. It's an atom that's been cut up and kind of rearranged and pushed into each of the corners, but we do have one atom total inside of this unit cell. Next up, let's find the radius of this atom. If you've ever wondered how it is that we find, or at least calculate, right, <laughs> determine experimentally how large atoms are, it comes down to these types of packing patterns. We can uh, visualize these packing patterns by shooting these surfaces with laser beams as the lasers bounce off and diffract at all sorts of different angles. We can figure out exactly where each of the atoms are inside of the structures. All depending on the packing pattern they form, we can also determine what the exact radius of the atom is. So let's turn our attention back to our unit cell here. Now the length of the edge of our unit cell from atomic nucleus to atomic nucleus, we have labeled here with the uh, variable L. So L is the edge length of our unit cell. And in this edge length or within this edge length, we can see that we have one atomic radius and then we have a second atomic radius because these two atoms are directly touching halfway down the length of our unit cell. This means that for every one edge length, for every L, we also have two atomic radius, right? One from the left, one from the right. So the edge length of our unit cell is going to be equal to 2R. In other words, our atomic radius is going to be equal to L divided by 2. The length of our unit cell 
can also be determined with all of these fancy lasers as they're shooting and refract or refracting off, reflecting off of the atomic surface, we can get a really good idea for exactly where the unit cells are in terms of surface. So experimentally, we can determine L and from this very simple equation, we can also calculate assuming that the atoms are making a cubic packing pattern, exactly what the atomic radius is going to be of the atoms inside of the structure. All right, last but not least, we're gonna talk about coordination number. So the coordination number is equal to the number of atoms touching one atom in the structure. So how many atoms are touching each other is really what the coordination number is getting at. How It's not just like how many atoms are present inside of the unit cell, but we're also going to consider how, how the atoms are actually arranging themselves inside of the unit cell. Now, if we inspect uh, the larger cubic packing uh, like illustration up on top, we can get kind of an idea for how many of these atoms are touching each other and the larger structure. If we pick out this atom right here, we can see that there's one atom touching it up above, one to the left, one to the right, one directly below it. We would assume, right, if we're illustrating this in 3D, that there is also a structure behind, or like an atom behind it inside of the structure. And if this were to continue infinitely, there would also be one in front of it. So each atom inside of the cubic packing pattern is going to have a coordination number of six because each atom is going to be touching six other atoms inside of this cubic arrangement. However, this cubic packing pattern is not the only way that atoms can arrange themselves inside of structures, right? It's actually not very space efficient to have every atom stacked directly on top of each other in this AA type of motif. So there are other ways that we can arrange these atoms, and we're gonna talk about two more of those ways today. There are actually 14 different ways <laughs> that crystals can stack. Uh, and again, we're just gonna be talking about the three most simple and as well, honestly, three most common ways uh, that these crystals commonly take form. All right, next we have what is known as the body-centered cubic packing pattern, which is primarily different than the cubic packing pattern because we now are following what is known as an ABAB motif. Now in the illustration directly to the right, just like on the previous slide, we're gonna slowly work our way through all the information. So we're just gonna take it bite by bite. In the packing pattern illustration here, the major difference is that we are looking down on the crystal. We're looking down from above. We're getting a sky view here. All right, so as we're looking down on this crystal, uh, we are actually looking down on the axes that we will use to label the A's and the B's. Right, so in the previous crystal, just gonna go back to draw a parallel here, I had said that we're going to draw an axis vertically up through the crystal, and this is our A axis. And the reason why this is called A A motif is because every atom is stacked directly on top of each other. In this motif, with the body-centered cubic packing pattern, we follow the A B A B pattern. So there are actually two different unique axes where the atoms will be running through. The first, and again, we're looking down on the axis, is going to be axis A. And the second is going to be here, following along axis B. And the atoms are going to be alternately stacked from A to B. In the third column up, it's gonna be back to A, and the, uh, or the third row, sorry. In the fourth row, we're gonna be back to B, and then back to A, and then back to B. It's just gonna keep alternating back and forth. Now with the side view of this looks like, side view is simplified in our at least first step towards creating our unit cell where we can see our first axis here the a axis has uh, two different atoms currently present in it as we work our way from bottom up we have our first layer here the second layer is nestled in between and the third layer is back up on top following the a in our second row the atom is actually lined up with our b axis so atom number one is in the A axis here, atom two is in the B axis here, atom three is back in the A axis, and if we were to continue growing this crystal, we would assume that the next would be present here on the B, and then we'd have another on the A, and then another on the B, and we're gonna keep alternating like so. 
to get a better idea for how the atoms are actually arranged inside of this structure, we're gonna simplify again to this ball and whoops, stick illustration. So each of the atoms are kind of shrunk and placed uh, centered where they would be in this larger, uh, more space filling model. And we can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of our atoms present uh, corresponding to our quote unquote A axis. And there are or there is only one present on the inside right here. This is why we call this the body-centered packing pattern, because there is literally one body in the center, where body is being used synonymously with atom. All right, but again, just like in the previous case, the ball and stick illustration is not the simplest or the smallest of a unit cell that we can make. So just like before, we're going to shave off the tops, the sides, the faces of the uh, square to give us the proper unit cell, which we have illustrated in the lower right hand corner. It can be a little difficult to pick out because everything is illustrated in red because we are looking at pure substances. Up on top, we have uh, alternating reds and blues just to illustrate the different axes, but currently we are still assuming pure substances with these crystals. So I'm going to outline a little bit where the edge pieces are just for some clarity. Let's see, along the corner and then here to trace the atom that's in the middle to see really where there, everything kind of cuts off. There. All right, so here we have a little bit of a better outline for every atom that is present inside of the structure. We can see pretty clearly that the unit cell looks a lot like our previous simple cubic unit cell. However, there is an atom schmooshed right on the inside. So we still have an eighth of an atom in every corner piece, but we also have one whole atom just shoved right into the middle. All right, so this unit cell we call the body-centered cubic unit cell, again, corresponding to the body-centered cubic packing pattern. The packing pattern is the overall like shape or the overall packing pattern. The unit cell, as a reminder, again, is the like most simple fo or form or way that we can use to represent the packing pattern. All right, this unit cell also goes by BCC for body-centered cubic. And just like our previous case, we're going to inspect a couple of different uh, like properties or observations that we can make of this unit cell. First, we're gonna count the total number of atoms inside of the unit cell. Well, just like before, as I said, we have an eighth of an atom in each of these corner positions. And before we counted that that was one eighth times eight corners, one whole atom, but we're also going to add to this our beautiful atom, the body right in the center of this unit cell. So the total number of atoms inside of a BCC unit cell uh, is two. So there is an additional atom inside of this unit cell as opposed to the previous packing pattern. This is our first sign that this uh, unit cell is more efficiently packed. Right, we can get more stuff inside of our unit cell if we follow the body-centered cubic packing pattern. Not all atoms will construct the same packing pattern. Not all of them will go for this more efficiently packed approach. And that ultimately comes down to how many valence electrons the pure element has, uh, what the arrangement of those electrons is, what type of hybridization it can undergo. So there are a lot of complicated factors that lead to exactly what packing pattern is gonna be the most stable for it. All right, so just like before, we can determine the atomic radius of any atom that is going to form a body-centered cubic packing pattern by observing the relationship between the edge length of the crystal and the arrangement of the atoms inside of the crystal. So the edge length of our crystal is still going to uh, be represented by variable L. However, we cannot simply say L divided by two is equal to the atomic radius because if we follow along the edge length here, we can see that there's a little bit of a gap between our atoms. This gap is the result of this first, or the, uh, the central atom being shoved into the middle. The central atom in the middle is actually going to push the edges away from each other a little bit. So we're going to increase the volume of our unit cell 
in order to accommodate this extra atom. All right, well, if we can't just go along the edge, how can we determine the radius of our atom? We are going to take advantage of a good old theory known as pi Pythagorean theorem. Right, so Pythagoras's theory of squares related the edge length to the hypotenuse. And because this is a cube, what do we have other than edge lengths, 90 degree angles for triangles, and a bunch of hypotenuses? So uh, the textbook kind of walks through the geometry of this, and we have some of the illustrations for how the lines kind of connect here. The edge length can be used to find the hypotenuse of the square's face, this diagonal, which is equal to L times half of two, or not half, the square root of two. And this hypotenuse then can be taken to be equal to the side of another triangle to find the distance from the lower left front corner all the way up to the back of this upper right corner. And the reason why we want to trace this line specifically is we can see from the lower front left all the way to the back upper right, we have atoms touching. This is what we want. The only way that we can find a relationship between the edge length of the unit cell and the atomic radius is if we find where in the cell the atoms are actually touching. So if we go from this lower front left corner to the upper back right corner, according to the Pythagorean theorem, the distance is going to be our first edge length L times the square root of three. So L times the square root of three, again being equal to this hypotenuse, contains one atomic radius, two atomic radius, three atomic radius, four atomic radius. Right, since we have half or we have one radius from this edge piece, there are two radii as we continue following along this large atom in the center, and one last radius from the edge piece in the back. So there are going to be four radii along the length that we know, according to the Pythagorean theorem, is equal to L times the root of three. So if we rearrange and solve for R, we're going to find that this is going to be equal to our edge length times the root of three divided by four. So if we know that our atoms are forming a body-centered cubic packing pattern, the radius of our uh, atom is going to be equal to that edge length times the root of three divided by four, just because of how this math works out geometrically speaking. The last piece of information that we need to assess is what the coordination number of each atom inside of the structure is. Again, how many other atoms will this atom be touching? The easiest way to see this is by turning our attention to the space filling model here, which I am going to just, <laughs> I'm going to erase this, give me a second. All right, there we go. Now that we can see it a little bit easier, now that we've cleaned up that section of the slide, we can, uh, by observing the atom in the center, pretty easily pick out how many atoms each is going to touch if we assume that this central atom is a representative of the whole. And so this atom is touching one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different atoms, each present in the corner of this cube. So the coordination number of each atom inside of the structure is going to be eight. And again, we are safe to assume that each atom will be touching eight others because in this unit cell or uh, like either the space filling model or the proper simplified unit cell, this is a representation of the whole crystal. Therefore, each atom we could pick out and assume as a new center in this body centered cubic packing pattern and will also assuredly be touching eight other atoms. The last of our packing patterns to discuss today is the most efficiently packed of all of the packing patterns we'll discuss, and this is known as the cubic closest packed. The cubic closest packed follows also the most complicated of all of the motifs that we have talked about, because there are three distinct axes that we can trace through any one of these structures. So we are going to be following the ABC ABC motif. The easiest way to pick out where these axes are is to observe our first illustration right here. So if we assume that the axis that is clearly illustrated is axis A, 
we can see that following this axis down through, I'm gonna say from this very top layer, down to the next layer, this axis runs directly between all of the atoms that are present in this layer down beneath, as well as if we go to the third layer down, the axis still runs between atoms. Therefore, our second layer down will be unique from the first, as will this third layer be unique from the first. So we're not gonna get back to an A layer until we're three layers down. If we inspect the red layer and the blue layer, and drawn axes through any of these layers as well, we would actually find kind of a similar phenomenon. So if we trace, let's say, through atom 5 and say that this is going to represent axis B, B does not come into contact with any atom in the layer directly below it either. So B is going to correspond to the axes uh, where the atoms in our second layer. And similarly, if we trace an axis through atom three, which is in the third layer down upwards, we can see that it is also not going to come into contact with anything in the layer above it. This defines our red layer and our blue layer as having atoms in unique locations. So we can label our blue layer as C, our yellow layer will be A, our red layer will be B, our blue layer will be C, and then once we get third or three layers down, our first layer is going to repeat again. So there are three unique placements per layer for each of these atoms inside of the cubic closest pack structure. And this is as efficiently packed as we can make it. In manufacturing, uh, industry standards for placing things like oranges and apples inside of shipping crates is to follow a cubic closest pack in order to like efficiently pack each crate to the best of their abilities, geometrically speaking, as well as like reducing shipping costs, etc. All right, so we're following the ABC ABC motif. What we do uh, to construct our unit cell then is to take the layers that are illustrated here, the yellow, the red, the blue, and then the next yellow corner, kind of pack them together and then tip them on their side. So we can see that our original axis A is what is illi or being illustrated running through uh, the like most extreme hypotenuse of this cube. Our red layer uh, B and our blue layer C are also kind of stacked sideways. Again, we can see that none of the atoms with their axes are going to be directly overlapping, giving us our three unique layers as we just talked about. It can be difficult to see exactly where each of the atoms is present inside of this cube in the space field model. And so again, as we have done before, we are going to reduce this to the ball and stick model. Now in the ball and stick model, it can still be a little bit difficult to see exactly where each of these atoms is located if they are not expressively present in the corner. So we can see that we do have atoms in the corners, but we also have six additional atoms and each of these atoms that are not in the corner are present on the face of the cube. So we have an atom on the face here, an atom on the face here, here, up on top, in the back, and on the right hand side. All right, so we have six faces and eight corner pieces. As we have also done before, we are going to shave off all of the excess to create the most simplified cube. And this is going to be our most simplified version of the unit cell, which will stand as a representative for the entire crystal. We call this unit cell the face-centered cubic cell, or FCC for short. The face-centered cubic cell or unit cell is going to be the representative of the cubic closed pact. So these two things also, uh, you might end up using synonymously, and I will take that as being okay. All right, so we're going to inspect this unit cell in, again, the same way that we have done before. So we are going to first count how many atoms are actually present inside of this unit cell. And again, it's total. we're totally free to cut up the total number of cut up pieces in here. We're looking for atoms total, not whole atoms. As I said already, the space filled model, it can be a little bit difficult to discern exactly where atoms are. And that's true for our unit cell as well. We can really only see three of the faces of this unit cell, because it is so densely packed, it's difficult to see what's going on on the backhand side or where atoms can like are present. So we're going to turn our attention to the ball and stick model here and make a couple of assumptions. First, 
we can see that we again have eight atoms in the corner. And as has been the case, each of our eight corner atoms were cut into eighth pieces. We're going to assume that this is still true. So we have eight times one eighth, and we're gonna add to it all of the atoms that are on the face. So what fraction of an atom is that which comprises the face location on a unit cell? Well, we can see uh, that each of these atoms present on the cell, it looks like we're just smoothly chopped in half. And in fact, if we go back to our previous slide where I had the fractions of the atoms placed all the way back here, I uh, said already <laughs> in the past that the uh, atoms that occupy the face locations of unit cells are going to be half atoms. The atom was just sliced directly in half and the uh, interior of this atom, this side right here, is going to be the piece that is exposed on the face of the unit cell. So each atom that's present on the face of a unit cell will be half of an atom, coming all the way back here. And so all we need to know is how many faces are there on a cube? Well, there is top down, left, right, back and front. Therefore, we have six faces and half of an atom on each of those faces. So if we crunch the numbers, we find that we're adding one to three, which is a total of four atoms inside of every face-centered cubic unit cell. This is going to make, at least in terms of a, a first kind of cursory glance general assessment, uh, our face-centered cubic unit cell, again, the most efficiently packed. We can plug separate pieces totaling up to four whole atoms inside of this unit cell. All right, so also like before, we're going to look at the atomic radius. There are plenty of pure substances that form this cubic close packed structure. And so we can use lasers and technology to figure out what the edge length of our unit cell is, which we can see here, and use it to approximate or calculate what the atomic radius of any one of these atoms is. Just like with the body-centered cubic packing pattern, we can see that there is a gap here between the atoms following along the edge length. Therefore, we can't just take half of the edge length like how we did with the simple uh, packed or the simple cubic packing pattern. So we're gonna have to inspect this atom or this unit cell and find where atoms are touching. Now we can see that this occurs along any face of the unit cell where there's going to be a corner piece touching the half along the center Cut, or, and then touching another corner piece on the other side. So just like before, we can use Pythagorean theorem to figure out what the distance here along the hypotenuse of the face is, and this is going to be equal to L times the square root of two. All right, so the distance along the hypotenuse is equal to L times the square root of two. We can also see, just like before, there is one radius, two radius, three radius, four radius along the face. So there are one, two, three different pieces of atoms present, but if we're taking into account how many radii this is, we have one, two, three, four radii present. All right, therefore, we have L times the square root of two is equal to four R, the hypotenuse equal to how many pieces of the radii there are, rearranged to solve for R, and we find that the atomic radius of any atom making a cubic closest packed packing pattern is going to be the edge length, times the square root of two, all divided by four. All right, last but not least, how many atoms are coordinated, how many atoms are touching each other inside of any one of these unit cells? Well, it can be pretty difficult to see based off of the packing pattern, either the space filled or the ball and stick model. So I'm just gonna give you this, <laughs> this number, how many atoms are touching each other, 12. Right, so not only do we have more atoms inside of the unit cell, but because of how efficiently packed everything is, each atom is touching 12 other atoms around it in the structure. So in brief review, we have discussed the construction of three different unit cells, our simple cubic packing pattern and its unit cell of the simple cubic unit cell, the body-centered packing pattern with the body-centered unit cell, and last but not least, the closest packed packing pattern with the face-centered unit cell. And we've kind of been using the total number of atoms present as well as how many atoms are touching as a rough ballpark estimate for how efficiently packed these things are. 
However, we can also quantitatively calculate what the packing efficiency is for any of these unit cells using the equation down below. So we can use the number of spheres or the numbers of atoms in the uh, unit cells present uh, plugged in here. So the total numbers of atoms that we've calculated thus far, the one for the simple cubic, the two for the body-centered cubic, and the four for the face-centered cubic would be plugged in right here. So it does contribute to the total packing efficiency. However, we also need to take into account the volumes of these unit cells and the volumes of the atoms that comprise them because <laughs> density is not just about how much stuff you have, but also about how much space it takes up. So we're going to multiply the number of spheres we have by the volume of each sphere, again, where sphere is going to pertain to the atom that we're actually observing. And then last but not least, we're going to divide by the volume of the unit cell. So what is the volume of the atom? How many of these atoms can we therefore fit into the unit cell itself? And then because we're doing a percent, we're gonna multiply by 100. All right, so two additional equations that we'll need. First, what is the volume of a sphere? Four thirds pi r cubed. So this is a pretty standard geometry equation. The r that we are going to insert is the same radius of atom that we have been uh, determining calculations for based off of the uh, edge length of our unit cell and the type of our unit cell. Last but not least, the volume of the unit cell is going to be L cubed, where L is again the edge length of our unit cell. So let's get some practice calculating these packing efficiencies as well as looking at what other uh, pieces of information we can gather from the unit cells, assuming that we know what type of packing pattern a particular element takes on. All right, so let's look at lithium. Lithium has been determined to form a body-centered cubic structure with a cell length of 351 picometers. We are going to use this information to determine, one, what's the atomic radius of lithium, two, what's the packing efficiency of lithium, and three, something we haven't quite talked about yet, but totally have the ability to calculate, What's the density of lithium? As always, I'm going to allow you guys to decompress and digest what we have talked about thus far. Attempt the problem on your own. It is a longer problem. So if you do get stuck, feel free to just unpause the video and then we'll work through it together. All right, welcome back. There are three things that we have to find, so let's just get started. I am going to first find the atomic radius. I'm just gonna go down the line Atomic radius first, packing efficiency second, density third. So we are told that lithium forms a body-centered cubic structure. So this means that all of the information pertaining to the body-centered cubic structure are going to pertain to lithium, including what the calculation uh, or what the equation looks like to calculate its atomic radius. So for a body-centered cubic structure, how we find the radius is by taking the cubed root of three, multiplying it by our edge length and dividing all of that by four. So we have our edge length in 351 picometers. Nowhere does it say that we need to convert this, at least not for the atomic radius. So we're going to keep this in picometers. We're gonna insert the 351 picometers here for L multiply it by the root of three and divide by four. So what we find based off of crunching these numbers is that the radius of lithium is gonna be equal to 152 picometers if we're rounding for significant figures. All right, and we're going to check that off, perfect. So we have now found the atomic radius. This is going to be useful as we move on to our second calculation, which is to find the packing efficiency. Now the equation that we are going to be using is the one that we just learned, packing efficiency is going to be equal to the number of spheres times the volume per every sphere divided by the volume of the unit cell. And we're gonna multiply all of this by 100. All right, so all 
of the information that we need, we either just calculated, or we can find again by observing all of the information corresponding to the body-centered cubic unit cell. For instance, the number of spheres present inside of a BCC unit cell is equal to two. Write two atoms per cell. We determined that already by just inspecting the unit cell. The volume of our unit cell, which is equal to four thirds pi r cubed, is going to be equal to four thirds times pi times 152 picometers cubed. Again, there's nothing that says that we have to convert these units anywhere. And in fact, so long as we keep our unit cell uh, edge length in picometers as well, then everything, all of our units should cancel appropriately. All right, so we have two for our number of spheres. We have volume of sphere being the four thirds pi times 152 picometers cubed. Last but not least, all we need is the volume of the unit cell, which is L cubed or 351 picometers cubed. And here exactly we can see picometers cubed will cancel with picometers cubed. Multiply everything by 100. So we crunch all of these numbers. Again, the equation might look complicated at first, but as soon as we start plugging our numbers in, it's like, oh, okay, that's not that bad. All I need to know is the radius and the edge length, and I can fill out this entire equation. Our packing efficiency ends up being equal to 68.1%. So check. We have now found both the atomic radius of lithium and the packing efficiency of lithium. All that we have left to do is find the density. Now, finding the density is going to take a little bit of finesse. The equation that we're going to be using is the same equation that we have been using since the fall. And if you've worked with this equation even before coming to college, then in like, you know, for even longer, density is equal to mass divided by volume. Our question is, what mass and what volume? Where are we plugging in this information? So to find the density of lithium, we are going to assume that the unit cell represents the properties of lithium. Right, since the unit cell is meant to be a snapshot, a repeatable snapshot nonetheless, we're going to assume that the density of the unit cell will be equal to the density of lithium. All right, the reason why this is useful for us is because it tells us we are looking for the density of the unit cell, which will be equal to the mass of the unit cell divided by the volume of the unit cell. All right, so we need mass of unit cell, we need volume of unit cell. So let's start by finding the mass. Then we can reassess the volume because we've technically already found it. We'll just look back again at it. Insert mass divided by volume and boom, we'll have density. So I have run out of space here. If you are still writing down some of this information on the slide, please pause the video now because I am going to clean it up. All right, so let's start by finding mass. Mass of unit cell. All right, well, how do we even start this? Well, we know what we're working with, right? We have lithium. This means that all of the information pertaining to lithium is going to be true here. Namely, it's molar mass. Right, we, we don't really know, we don't have a mass measurement given to us, but we can figure it out. So here's how we do this. We'll need the molar mass definitely along the way, but our first question is like, again, how much lithium are we even working with? The unit cell is very small. So how many atoms are present inside of the unit cell? Inside of a body-centered cubic structure, no matter what element is present, there are two atoms. This is going to be true for every body-centered cubic structure. So if we have two atoms, and we know the identity of the atom type, lithium, it seems like we're starting to set up a problem that we have solved for before. What is the mass? What is the mass of two atoms of lithium? Right back in the first semester, like chapter one, chapter two, when we first learned what Avogadro's number was, this was the type of problem that we learned how to solve. It was just abstracted 
And that was the whole point, right? What was the mass of two atoms? And it was like, cool, because we could find that, but there wasn't really further utility for that knowledge. Now there is. We're gonna find what the mass of two lithiums or two atoms of lithium is and use that to be the mass of the unit cell because there are two atoms of lithium inside of the unit cell. All right, so how did we construct that type of problem before? Like, how did we go about solving it? We had to start with two atoms. Specifically, we have two atoms of lithium. And our goal now is to use unit conversions to get from the unit of the atom and move to the unit of the gram because we are trying to calculate the density in grams per centimeter cubed. So to get out of the unit of atom and into a unit that's going to get us to gram, we're going to need the mole. Our mole, again, being equal to Avogadro's number, says that we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per every one mole. And we know that we needed this conversion step because in order to get grams, we'd already picked out that lithium has a molar mass that is freely available to us. And molar masses, again, are in units of grams per mole. They are never in units of pure grams, always grams per mole. So if we wanna use the molar mass, we need to know how many moles of atoms we're actually working with, and we can calculate that using Avogadro's number. So this is a refresher on that type of problem that we have solved before. All right, now that we are out of the unit of the atom and into the unit of the mole, we can use that molar mass for the final step in calculating the mass of our unit cell. According to the periodic table, each lithium element or atom has a molar mass of 6.941 grams per every single one mole. Meaning we are now out of the unit of the mole and into the unit of grams lithium. So we're gonna take two, divide it by Avogadro's number, multiply it by the molar mass, and this is going to give us 2.305 times 10 to the negative 23rd grams. All right, so now we have the mass of the unit cell, and the calculation itself was not that challenging. The real trick was setting up this calculation in the first place, right? So we had to use a bit of critical thinking and a few logical steps to get there, but if in the future you were asked to find the density of some material and you know what the cubic packing pattern is, you can use this same approach, atoms to moles to grams. All right, well, now that we have the mass of the unit cell, all we need is the volume of the unit cell. Specifically though, this time we are asked to find the volume explicitly in, an, in a unit of centimeters cubed. So in order to find the uh, volume in centimeters cubed, what I'm going to do first is convert our measurement of picometers into centimeters. This is gonna save me on a lot of stress because converting from picometers cubed to cent or centimeters cubed is a little bit more tricky and oftentimes trips people up. So we're just gonna convert this right away. 351 picometers converting into centimeters. We know that there are 10 to the 12 picometers per every one meter. And similarly, we know that there are 100 centimeters per every one meter. Therefore, the conversion factor is going to look like 100 centimeters divided by 10 to the 12 picometers. These two numbers are equivalent. And this value is going to be equal to 3.51 times 10 to the eight centimeters, or oh, to the negative eight centimeters, excuse me. So if we are looking for volume, now all we need to do is take this length in centimeters and cube it, right? Volume of the unit cell is equal to length cubed. So we're gonna take the 3.51 times 10 to the negative eight centimeters, and we're going to raise it to the third power. Our volume of the unit cell is therefore going to equal 4.32 times 10 to the negative 23rd centimeters cubed. So now we have a mass for the unit cell, we have a volume for the unit cell, and our density is going to be equal to mass divided by volume. Therefore, the density, which is going to be equal to 2.305 times 10 to the negative 23 grams, 
divided by our volume of 4.32 times 10 to the negative 23rd centimeters cubed is going to be equal to 0 0.546 grams per centimeters cubed. All right, so all of that work to find one simple number, but this density does have a pretty awesome implication. First and foremost, it is less than the density of water, so uh, which is around one gram per centimeter cubed. And what this means for us is that dense or the density of lithium being lesser is that it's going to float on water. However, pure substances are not the only substances that make uh, or form these types of packing patterns. Ionic formulas do, or ionic compounds do as well. And so we've seen how to calculate things like atomic radius and edge length and now density and packing efficiency and all these cool things. All of those same lessons can be applied to ionic crystals as well. The only difference is that our ionic crystals can sometimes form slightly more intricate or involved shapes that still kind of fall under the original form of, let's say, a simple packing or a body-centered or a face-centered cubic unit cell. For instance, our crystalline structure for calcium fluoride is pictured here on the right. And what we're going to learn how to do is observe this unit cell and find what the chemical formula of this compound is. Now, of course, we already know how to find these types of chemical formulas by taking a balance of the charges of our cation and our anion, right? We learned how to do that back in like chapter five. What's really cool is that the chemical formula as determined by the unit cell will match that based off of our ionic charges. So not only are things like shape, volume, and density traceable back to the construction of the unit cell, but the chemical formula is too. So this unit cell truly is a snapshot, a very tiny representation of the larger crystal. All right, so the shape of the crystal is caused by the shape of the unit cell, and the unit cell can be used to determine its chemical formula. So our calcium fluoride crystal, we can see physically here on the left, it looks like this weird amalgamation of a number of different cubes kind of like smooshed into each other. In each of these individual cubes is the result of the cubic unit cell that the structure forms on the molecular or atomic ionic level. All right, so the white circles or spheres, we are told are the calcium two plus, the gray are the fluoride minus. So let's pick out and count all of the different atoms that we have, all of the different ions, and then we're gonna put them together. So we'll start with our gray, uh, or sorry, the white calcium two plus. All right, so first and foremost, just because a whole atom is present on the outside of our structure does not mean that we are going to be counting the whole atom. Remember, our unit cells are going to be shaved off. We want a perfect cube, the simplest representation that we can get. So what we're going to do is first and foremost, kind of remind ourselves that if we see a total atom present, for instance, like we do here on the corner, we are not going to be counting the whole thing, but rather only the piece that's inside the cube. Same thing is going to go for the atoms here on the face. There may be a whole atom of this calcium present here on the face, but we're only going to count that which is inside of the unit cell. All right, the reason why we do this, the reason why we only count that which is inside the unit cell, again, is because what's in the unit cell is a representation of the larger piece. We only want to consider what is the smallest representation of the larger structure. So I'm not gonna draw all of the individual like cuts present here, but I do want to kind of like for the corner pieces for those inside here, just so we can like really emphasize we're only looking on the inside of this cube. All right, now that that tangent's kind of out of the, the way, the informative tangent, let's count the atoms. So we can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight corners occupied by calcium. And as we've also seen, corner pieces count for one eighth of an atom. This is still going to be true. Again, just because this picture has whole atoms illustrated does not mean that the whole atom is actually inside of the unit cell itself. So we have eight corners times one eight, giving us one calcium two plus so far, calcium two plus. 
We're also going to count how many faces there are. We can see that there are still some calcium things left. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six faces. And as we've also seen with the face-centered cubic unit cell, each face atom is actually half of an atom, right? This atom's chopped in half. This gives us three additional calcium two pluses inside of the structure for a grand total of four calciums inside the unit cell. Now that all of the calciums are counted, let's turn our attention to the gray fluorides, which now I have changed color to red, just to emphasize uh, like the difference here. We can see that the gray pieces are present entirely inside of the cube. These are not on the face. These are not on an edge. They are not on a corner. They are totally inside. Any atom that is totally inside is going to count for one whole atom. Because if it's inside the unit cell, it's protected from the shears that we use to trim off our unit cell and to make it a perfect cube. So we have one whole atom present inside of the unit cell. Um, or we have a number of whole atoms present inside of the unit cell. Our question is how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight times eight. We have eight whole atoms present inside of the cell in the form of fluoride. So we have eight F minuses. Well, how we take this information and turn it into a chemical formula, as we have done many times before, is to take this number, this counting number, and drop it into the subscript. So we have calcium four, fluoride eight, and because this is an ionic crystal, we are going to reduce this to the lowest whole numbered ratio as we have also done many times before. And we end up with CaF2, calcium fluoride, which is exactly what we would expect because we have two positive charges for every calcium and a single negative charge for our fluoride. So of course, if we're gonna charge balance everything, we're gonna need two of our fluorines per every one calcium. But again, what's really cool is not that we can necessarily just find the formula using our unit cell, but that the formula matches, right? That we were able to scale this all the way down to the ionic level and the ratio of the atoms or ions in this case that come together will lead to the chemical formula that we would predict that we see. And not only that, but the unit cell gives us a picture for how the ions are arranging themselves in order to maximize charge attraction. Right, if we have two times the number of fluorine per every calcium, I would certainly hope that e each of these fluorides is actually arranging themselves to touch uh, or maximize the number of like contact points they have which, with each of the calciums, which we can see in here, there definitely seems to be a pattern where the fluorines are arranging themselves to be surrounded by calciums above and below. And similarly, the calciums are arranging themselves to be surrounded by fluorines above and below in these sort of like tetrahedral positions. And that is all I have for you today. So between part two and part three, we have discussed the different types of solids that we can form, as well as how those solids actually arrange themselves atomically, molecularly, etc., and all of the different properties that we can find about a substance because of it. All right, so here I have a couple of example problems for you guys, literally just two, a couple. Uh, so give them a go if you feel so inclined. If you have any questions, again, please do not hesitate to reach out and ask those questions. I would love to clear up any confusion. If you have any homework, please do your homework. And until next time, class is dismissed.